Uh, but this is an honor to be here at State of the Net to talk a bit about the Trust and Safety Professionals Association. And anyone that is in this field um, definitely knows the last name Wilner and the importance that they have towards uh, trust and safety and really creating the rules of the road for many of our social media companies, other uh, tech platforms as we enter into the uh, 21st century and beyond. So it's really an honor um, to be here today. And I'm thinking, um, as mentioned, Tim mentioned, I'm at Facebook now, I'm a public policy director over trust and safety. And I've been at Facebook for almost five years coming in 2016. And prior to 2016, I don't know much about quote unquote T and S, like they were close in the alphabet, S, T, right? But I didn't know anything else about it. And at that point, Charlotte actually had a decade in the game, uh, as the kids say, she had a decade under her belt. I was, has been doing this for a long time. So not new to this, but true to this when I was just a young, young um, lad in there. But Charlotte, it is great to see you. So ever so happy uh, that we get to connect even in this uh, weird environment at State of the Net. And I'm sure the joke has been made um, already, but I must do it. Um, I don't know how the State of the Net is doing on the East Coast. It sounds like everything has been an outage, um, but I'll, I'll get my, my dad jokes out of the way early. But uh, good to see you, Charlotte. How are you? I am. I am suffering through so many dad jokes uh, on my side too. We got, uh, you know, these two parents at home. We got two kids at home. It's a, it's a. I mean, it's a great time to start an entirely new job, uh, make a huge career change, which is what I chose to do. So, um, thank you so much for for welcoming me here, and, and thank you to all of you for inviting me. It's it's uh, my life's delight to talk about trust and safety professionals, uh, and I'm really hoping to be able to share a lot about that with you today. No, and I think it's uh, really important for, you know, many of us to to understand a bit more about trust and safety. And I somewhat jokingly said putting the TNS together, but thinking of this um, even from five years ago to now where it is today, the size of the industry and that this is a really viable career for many people and the role that they play. And we have so many folks talking about all the issues du jour, whether that is regulations to govern um, speech online, um, all of the, uh, you know, kind of uh, matters that really are important top of mind for folks that whether it's the Times or the Journal or online uh, thinkers will, will, will go at, ad nauseum. But um, there are a group of people who are doing their best to, I think, uh, really try to promote the principles of trust and safety into that number, into that letter. I want you to um, perhaps maybe just give us a little bit of a walk through your career. Um, you know, I know that you started at Facebook, but maybe others don't. A little bit about Facebook, what brought you from, what caused you, not necessarily caused you to leave Facebook, but the opportunities you pursued after. And then- uh, Dish, yeah. Dish, dish. That's, that's actually what I'm here. It's all, it's all part of my gossip back. And then, uh, but then uh, what really um, motivated you to take this role? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so I, uh, I graduated with an English degree, which I love to tell people because this is living proof of what you can in fact do with an English degree. Um, I did begin my career at Facebook. At the time, I started in customer support. It was, uh, as it was then known, CS, now known as computer science, very different. Um, and I started off originally just doing like manual password reset. So this was like the days before security questions. And then even when we had security questions, there was no automated way to reclaim your password, which I think most of us take for granted now. You know, you click a link and it sends you a secure link and it's fine. No, no. So we were the team who was sitting there having to type out to people, okay, what is your favorite pizza topping? And then waiting for them to respond. And then they would inevitably get it wrong because it turns out people's toppings, the, the favorite changes all the time. Um, so, you know, cheese and pepperoni, maybe it's mushrooms the next day and you lost your Facebook account forever. So fortunately, many changes have happened since those days. Um, when I was there, I, uh, I started with our international support team. I ran our, actually our first international support team at Facebook uh, because I spoke some French and that was sort of how we did it back then. <laughs> so fortunately also moved beyond those days. Uh, I did that for a few years and then switched over into safety. Uh, as it was then known at the time, um, I was the first safety manager on the operations side at Facebook. And um, at, in those days, that was any sort of real world or imminent harm, uh, which of course now has a vast galaxy of people working on it at, at Facebook. I was just on the careers site the other day looking at all the varieties of things. And 
uh, it's incredible just how much it has grown. You know, when I left Facebook in 2013, I had a team of 40 and we had uh, maybe about a hundred outsourcing partners. And that was it. That was, the, I, I, I could know everybody who worked on trust and safety issues at Facebook. And clearly that is no longer the case. Um, but that sort of illustrates the necessity of an organization like the Trust and Safety Professional Association. Um, I went on to Pinterest uh, in 2013 and founded their safety team, their trust and safety team on the operations side. And one of the things I noticed immediately was how much work I was having to redo and how many wheels I was having to reinvent just starting at a new company. And it wasn't some backwater company. It was Pinterest, right? Yeah, it's good people over there. But so much of that sort of institutional knowledge that we built up at a place like Facebook, you had to start completely over someplace else. And that's another thing that I've been thinking about a lot as I've watched more and more people come into the space. A lot of people have to learn these trust and safety lessons the hard way. And it doesn't actually have to be so hard. There are ways we could make that easier for the practitioners. Um, and so one of the reasons I really chose to, I, I chose to do a career change in a pandemic, which is a very normal thing to do. It's bold. It's bold. You're, you are bold, bold. You know, on, on, the, on the cutting edge. So yeah, it, yeah. It, it, I like to be on the cutting edge. Um, but one of the reasons is that, you know, of course, trust and safety, the work of trust and safety, uh, I think is, is in the public eye more than ever now. And those practitioners are in the public eye more than ever now. But those practitioners are a lot of regular people who do a lot of really hard work, have a a lot of really good insight. And there's just not a lot of connective tissue right now in that whole body between the the sorts of people who do that work, all the different types of work that get performed in that space and people outside the industry, like the ones I think I am probably talking to right now on the other side of this Zoom. Uh, And there's so much potential there. And that's, that's why I want to work on this. No, that, that, that's wonderful. I maybe just to kind of tease that out, because I think you're absolutely correct that there are so many people um, that are, you know, being introduced to trust and safety, uh, maybe over the last, you know, three or four years, it's become a bit more commonplace to, to kind of know these terms, or at least how um, some of the uh, companies are, are using them um, to operate in, whether it's create policies and enforce policies. But if you can maybe describe a bit about the roles of that mm-hmm. people, uh, trust and safety professional will hold because they are, they are very, they are very, there are many roles that they can. Absolutely. Yes. I think a lot of people, uh, in fact, one of the questions we got when we were founded, when we were um, getting set up was, well, why aren't you the content moderators professional association? And it's because, well, content moderation is a big part of what we do, but that's not the only thing that happens in the trust and safety universe. So uh, for us, we define trust and safety uh, professionals, anyone who is developing or enforcing policies that define acceptable behavior online. So yes, that is you know the the content moderators that you might think of, um, but that's also policy writers. That's also um, you know one to one reviewers. That's risk analysis professionals. That's some legal and compliance work. Uh, that can be some product work, some engineering work. Uh, so it goes pretty far beyond you know this this I think more antiquated notion of like a person in front of a computer saying yes or no. Uh, though again, that is actually a huge part of what the space does as well. Well, that, that's a, I appreciate that. And I want to kind of dive in perhaps to a few questions about the size and scope. And um, that's something that's, you know, kind of really came over me recognizing the scope uh, and, and size of just online communication in general and the billions of people that um, can interact on the various platforms. Mm-hmm. And then to think about the size and scope of what the Trust and Safety Professionals Association can be and the folks who work in this space. But maybe just um, before we get there, you mentioned a variety of jobs. Mm-hmm. Um, what to, for you as a leader in this industry, as a person that came into the industry in 2006 and now has, you know, kind of exceeded, you know, achieved these heights, when you look at building a team and you look at trying to craft the right trust and safety uh, organization and, and finding the attributes that make someone actually skilled and good in this area, what, do, what are you looking for? And what, what has stood out to you as something that's, you know, that's a really valuable trait to be a TSPA? Absolutely. I think, I think one of the most important things you can do in setting up a trust and safety team is evaluate what is your product for, right? Or what is your organization for? And 
really do a good think about who are the voices that then need to be in that room in order to make this a success. Understanding that is, if it is a success, you're going to grow and you're going to grow in ways that you maybe don't anticipate, but you then have to adapt to. So when I'm looking at who's really successful in this field, it is people who are adaptable, right? Who are able to come in and not really necessarily know what they're getting themselves into that day, but know they're down for the challenge. Um, it's people who are resilient, right? Who are really able to grapple with difficult things and maintain balance with that in their lives, with their families, with their personal relationships. Um, and it's people who are able to bring a different perspective to the table than um, the rest of the group. And I think I'd say that in particular is something that's very important to consider because of the growth um, potential that your product has. You know, when I was at first at Facebook, I'll never forget the day we started seeing pornography on Facebook. Can you imagine just a little? And specifically, it was coming from this exotic international location, Ontario. Mm, we'd never seen something like this before way back in those days. So it was, uh, oh, uh, yes, yes. And um, we we had to, you know, we looked around the room and, and I tried to figure out, okay, well, what do we do with this kind of content? And of course, that was extremely uh, vanilla, as they say, compared to what came later. But, um, you know, as we were grappling with new and different challenges, we we realized Facebook was designed, as, as an example, Facebook was designed to connect the world, but we didn't actually know as like a bunch of 20-something white college kids out of like a lot of fancy schools, we didn't know what the world needed. We didn't, we didn't feel particularly qualified to be able to say, ah, yes, here is how people should behave. And so, you know, we did our best in that time with sort of the, the principles that we could read about, the research that was that was available, which as you may remember in 2007 was none or very little. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we only really felt like we found our sea legs once we were actually able to hire people who came from other places, who had had different upbringings, who were able to really explain this is the impact of a decision like this and how you can expect it to play out on your platform. And that's where I think, again, the role of the trust and safety professional, our job in a lot of these um, companies or in a lot of these organizations is explaining that impact to people. Say, okay, if the, if we decide to do the following, here's what's probably going to happen, right? Here's what's going to happen within the ecosystem of the product. Here's what's going to happen in terms of real world harm or real world impact. Here's what's going to happen to the people who are actually engaged in the work. Um, and that's a lot of what we we are trying to focus on as an organization. No, that, that's, that's well said, that risk analysis and maybe the way that you framed it, I love that. Uh, we don't have necessarily have to kind of reinvent the wheel each time. There are organizations that have uh, you know stood up and they've become much more mature since um, the early days and there are lessons learned. You know, again, not to say that one organization has figured it out completely, but learning from those that have already experienced some, I think, is really important. And I, I really do appreciate your words about the both diversity and cultures and perspectives, you know, race, gender, um, ability um, down the line, um, and thinking of the impacts that it has on the community because. The way that I, and I know that you, you've described it this way in the past too, is that in many ways, trust and safety professionals, they serve as you know, advocates for the communities that, they, that the platforms um, seek to reach. And that is one that, whether it's from a safety perspective or a trust perspective, things that we need to do to make sure that the policies make sense, to make sure that people's experience online are right. Um, question, I, I do wanna tease this out a bit. So because you've had such a, you know, like a unique, perspective on these things. Thinking through, you know, I'm at now mature Facebook, um, if, we, if, we, if we are mature in that sense, I've, you know, I've been around much longer than some of the startups. Um, what do you think um, kind of are the challenges for a startup entering in this space? And perhaps what do you, and you've, you've hinted at this, but other things that you would love to achieve through um, the TSPA to ensure that new entrants into the uh, community um, are supported well. Yeah, um, I, as you mentioned, I, I just joined, this is like day 33 for me, I think, but I'm in there like uh, just saying what we're all about. So um, sounds like you have three, right. three, I gave you a month. So I know, <laughs> I know, so like here we here. are. Yeah. So here's what I believe we are gonna be working on and uh, you know, hey everybody, give us some feedback. Um, so 
the main focuses we are going to have as an organization, and we, we have already, um, are connecting and convening our community. Uh, and that is a vast community. Uh, you know, right now we have a certain set of founding corporate supporters, and we will be expanding that. But we also need to figure out, okay, how are we actually being inclusive of the over 100,000 content moderators alone around the world? Um, and that's a big job. Uh, but we do want to be active in connecting all professionals in that way. Uh, we need to be providing resources for navigating the challenges that are somewhat unique to our profession. Uh, an example of this is uh, with wellness and resilience programs, especially in the early days of trust and safety. The only people we could really get to come in and talk to us about this sort of work were um, vicarious trauma counselors who had done like a uh, counseling for EMTs and ambulance workers, because it was like, well, that's kind of like, and it's like, well, that's not really what we do, but there are, there are parallels, right? So figuring out, okay, like what are the, what are, what resources are available and appropriate for, for folks who really do this job? Um, and then uh, fostering career growth, um, which as you mentioned, I really wanna have a focus on building pipelines into the profession and up through the ladders of the profession um, and diversifying the voices at the table. Um, I think, to your sort of original question of sort of what is it like for startups in this space? This is a question I think is so important for this audience in particular, because there is a lot of difference between the Facebooks and the Googles and all these larger platforms and the startups and not just in terms of size or funding or any of these, um, but in terms of like how much one can actually do and what expectations we can reasonably have of them. And an example of this, um, you know, let, let me pick on, let me pick on uh, a, a Silicon Valley darling who I, I know some people there and they're doing a, a great job. Let's talk about Clubhouse, right? So Clubhouse, think, think if you will, if you're not familiar, Clubhouse is an audio chat platform, essentially, and I'm going to get it wrong. Someone from Clubhouse is going to be watching this like, oh. but um, it's an audio chat platform where you can go in and kind of have chat rooms. And there's a few speakers like, you know, you and I talking panelists, and then there's a bunch of people listening in and people can come and listen in at will and leave and create their own private rooms. And now picture any of you in the audience, if you had to manage abuse on this platform, right? Okay. It's real time. It's all audio. So you can't be running any kind of visual signifiers, anything like that. Okay. How are you going to do it? Are you going to have a spy in every pub, in every private room? Are you going to like, how are you going to do it? And that's a startup. It's a, it's a new type of technology. It's really popular. People love this thing, right? It's got a really lot popular. of good things going for it. Yeah. I, I was a skeptic. I joined, I was like, oh no, I love it. You know, but <laughs> Okay, so it's happening, right? How do we how do we help platforms like that who are now going to grapple with like, okay, we're popular, we better figure it out, right? How do we as an industry, how do we as professionals and how do sort of you as the public do that? Um, how do we account for the fact that, listen, if it's not Clubhouse, it's gonna be some other startup doing some other cool thing that a lot of people are gonna wanna get into, right? Okay. How do we, you know, make rules about that? How do we actually ensure that people are having a safe experience, understanding that it's going to be like two dudes in a room. It's not going to be the Facebook trust and safety team of hundreds of people all around the world. Um, and the scale is just so different. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's really, um, I think, spot on. And I hadn't thought of Clubhouse in that, in those terms, but yeah, the challenges that they are facing now, you're absolutely correct, are uh, perhaps not completely novel, but they are, they are daunting. Um, in many ways. And um, as, as I said um, um, many times, uh, 35,000 people now at Facebook focus on safety and security. And we are, we are big. Awesome. I love we're, to hear it. Yes. We, we, are, we are huge. So maybe we have a, a few new partners there. I, I did want to, um, to that end, and maybe a little bit of a segue here. Um, we talked a lot about the actual individuals I'm hearing. We talked about why, what the, the organization could do. But I haven't heard perhaps um, it, it voiced um, how the organization actually came about, right? You know, I think we all know Eric down in Santa Clara and, and his grade who was on the, I think the previous panel here, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about how the organization came about and perhaps maybe as a segue to how you work with other another, the other organization that was recently founded, the Trust and Safety Foundation. Yeah. Um, so yes, Eric, Eric was key to this process. Um, Eric, a couple of years ago, uh, decided to host a panel or a panel of an event called content moderation at scale. And um, there have been a few 
COMO conferences as they're now called. Um, and the first one many practitioners went to and we were all like, wow, this is great. Somebody should like do more of these. Yeah. You know, and then, you know, a year goes by and we all went to the second one and we're like, Hey, remember how great this was? We should do this again. But there wasn't, um, there wasn't like a, a particular, like, you know, in CPR, they teach you like, okay, you do this and you point to someone and say, you're responsible for calling the ambulance. There was no pointing until uh, Eric and Adeline Sai and Clara Tsao came together and said, you know what? We could be the people. We could do this. Um, and so they did the tremendous work of putting together a, a proposal for an organization, figuring out what are the contours of this? What are the limits? How, you know, how would we fund it? They did the roadshow uh, and went around to a bunch of uh, the companies who are now our founding corporate supporters. Uh, this was all in a pre-COVID world. And so at the time, I actually was on the receiving end of the pitch at when I was at Pinterest and looked at my boss. We thought, yeah, this seems pretty good. Yeah, we should do this. And I think the idea was like, oh, we're going to have a lot of in-person events and we're going to like be able to connect with each other and really build those relationships. And that is still going to be a critical part of what we do. But I think what, what the pandemic has really underlined for us is, you know, one, we need to be able to do these things via Zoom for health and safety reasons. But there's also an accessibility question that is actually very neatly solved or solved much more neatly by making more of this virtual, by figuring this out online. Because, you know, as you mentioned earlier, you've got what, 35,000 people at Facebook alone. Or are they all in Menlo Park? They are not, right? So Thanks figuring out how do we get more people together. Um, so that's that's sort of how we got started. Um, Trust and the Trust and Safety Foundation is our sibling organization. And I am I'm executive director of both, so I'm kind of like I'm my own twin. Uh, <laughs> I, I actually have a twin. I should not insult her by saying I'm my own twin. That's twin erasure. She's wonderful. Oh, I wish I would have. I don't think I knew that. I wish I would have known earlier because that would have spawn us down a different path oh, of conversation. Well, she's fraternal and she's a school librarian. She's everything I wanted to be when I grew up, but here I am instead. <laughs> um, so uh, with trust, the Trust and Safety Foundation, the Trust and Safety Foundation uh, is meant to um, sort of focus on uh, improving society's understanding of, the, of trust and safety work. Like what does this work actually mean? Um, as an example of that, like we are already publishing um, these case studies done by Copia, the Copia Institute, um, which is they're just like, okay, here's a problem that a, a platform had to solve. Here are the factors they had to consider. What did they do? Um, and that seems so straightforward. And they're like, hundreds of thousands of these in the waiting in the wings, but they're excellent for, you know, if you are a legislator or you are a professor and you're having to kind of run through some of the real nitty gritty, okay, here's a window in, here's, you know, a set of hard decisions. How would you evaluate this? So that's- Or if you're interviewing I mean. for a role, that I would have loved this five years ago. Right, yeah. If you're, if you're an interviewer, you know, you're, you're trying to get a job, these are great practice. Um, you, you joke, but actually that is probably how we're going to use them. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we're doing things like that. We want to be in the role of um, like connecting practitioners and researchers. Uh, when the pandemic started, we had all these questions as professionals about what is going to be the impact of remote work on these on these workers, because I mean, they're already doing this very difficult job. A lot of them are viewing very graphic content. Now we're sending them home to view graphic content. What's that about? And we, as as professionals in the space had a, had a suspicion that there's probably research out there in the world about the impact of graphic work, the impact of remote work. Like there's probably stuff we could learn, but we didn't know where to start or who to talk to or how to access that. And we want the Trust and Safety Foundation to be uh, a connector there, right? To be aware of what kinds of studies are out there in the space and how can we make sure that that information is actually getting to practitioners and researchers who are doing studies actually have access to those practitioners as well, right? They know who to ask for surveys, who to ask for studies, that kind of stuff. Um, we're planning on amplifying research that's already available or already underway. Uh, we may commission um, some research. We're sort of working to set our mission on that side of the organization right now, but I think there's a lot of need for certain sorts of benchmark studies uh, that I think um, a lot of our members and a lot of our corporate supporters would be interested in having, and I would certainly be interested in having. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and probably all of you would be interested in having to have some real data behind the assumptions we all make about this work. No, I, th I think that's, that's uh, spot on, especially uh, working for data-driven companies, but I think it just helps us produce 
um, you know, kind of very, very well reasoned and well um, deliberate. Um, yeah. Kind of whether it's legislation, regulation, um, even just having commentary that that's better informed is always helpful. I know that we are coming up on time, but I did have one, one to get to maybe one or two questions. Did have one from the audience? And I think we addressed this a bit, but um, I'll read it as such. First, congratulations um, on the new role, Charlotte. But do you think a trust and safety team serves as a kind of standing for the entire company and its values? or the entire user population and its values. And we, I think we talked about that a bit about it being an advocate, um, but I'd love to hear your um, kind of your take and, and how you've positioned your teams um, in the past. Yeah. Um, I see the follow-up to this question is, if the easy answer is both, and I regret to inform you, it is both. But insofar as, you know, trust and safety, teams are often sort of this intermediary where, and I know intermediary has this whole legal definition. We're not going to for this. That's not what I'm talking about. Um, but, you know, these professionals are the ones who stand between the users and everybody else who's working on that product or that system. And so you sort of are translating both ways. You're in this breach where you're having to say, okay, the company says this, and here's what we're trying to you know, educate you on or inform you of, but the user base says this, and this is what we need to be conveying back to the people who are building this product or this, this service. Um, there is absolutely, there are absolutely many times where those values conflict um, in, in some pro-social ways and some anti-social ways, right? There are many platforms out there where uh, users want to do bad things, right? Then and, and like, okay, the company doesn't really want them to do that. And neither does the trust and safety team. And like, all right, listen, that's feedback that we're just not going to pay attention to. But there are a lot of cases where... Um, you know, especially if you've got a company who is willing to take a lot of risks on growth, um, who's willing to, uh, you know, prioritize certain metrics over others, which is, I mean, it sounds like I'm subtweeting and I'm not, this is like literally many companies in Silicon Valley, uh, their trust and safety teams do end up in, uh, in a bit of a tough spot where they're realizing like, okay, hey, you made this really easy to like upload your entire address book and turn the camera on your phone on, but now we have all these problems and this is what it means. Um, and in those cases, I think that's where something like TSBA, we really wanna provide um, as much information to those practitioners stuck in situations like that as we can to be like, hey, actually this has played out in other companies or in other situations and this is how we handled it. Um, and also to be able to be a sort of a, a third party resource for those product teams who might question, they're like, well, our trust and safety team says this, but I don't know if that, and actually being present to say, oh, and they're right. Yes, this is actually how it works. Um, and just being able to sort of broaden that conversation, I think helps a lot. Uh, that's great. And I think we're almost going to wrap. So I'm going to uh, do a couple quick fires here. Uh, actually let you answer this question to, to make sure that we have the website correct. And then um, three questions um, directly. I'm going to int introduce my three questions. So you think about th this um, first. Uh, trust or safety, cake or pie, and then your favorite meme from your collection. You are the best meme aggregator that I know on social media. Your favorite meme of the last, uh, I don't know, let's say six months. Um, we'll go go there. We'll go there. And uh, but, but just before we, we answer those questions, um, two very, I think, important questions. What can folks who currently work at platforms um, do to help further this effort? And how can individuals join? And maybe that's the, the best question. Yes. How can individuals join and become involved? So uh, you go to tspa.info, uh, you get on to the newsletter. There's a place to sign up for the newsletter there. We are debuting our 2021 membership structure, I hope next week, in the next couple of weeks. Um, and we're going to be in touch about that, hoping to get obviously new companies, but also individual memberships going. So please stay tuned. Make sure you got the newsletter. Um, the uh, other, sorry, what was the other question? There's something about uh, case studies. We yeah, so, so pie, pie or cake. It's, it's oh, an age. Oh, oh yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, trust or safety, I would say trust. And that's like a whole conversation at a bar. We'll, we'll save that. We will table that for, for the next time. Uh, I would say. Cake. On that table, we have cake, and you are cake. wrong on two accounts. Yeah, okay. well, but the funfetti <laughs> is like a whole thing. So, oh. you know, we just. We got, you can have the pie and I can have the cake. It's fine. Well, I, I guess like you, you are a win-win person. I must, I'm a win-win. 
it's my job. It's my job. I kill <laughs> all threats and then make them win wins. Uh, my favorite meme. I actually one of my colleagues bought me this. And it's now my go-to work month. But this is the this is fine dog, and you've that seen go through many evolutions in the last six months. Um, uh, but you know this this is uh, you see one now where there's a fire and there's a bunch of dogs sitting around happy, and that's is fine. One of them, the fire is just out, and he just says, "Oh, this is fine," you know. So um, love him, love a good name. Neil, thank you so much for this. This, is this, is, this, has, been, this has been fun. Um, we should do it again. Uh, I am going to send it back over to Tim, though. I know that we have a, a very esteemed uh, group of guests after the after what I hope is a break coming up. A um, couple of keynotes in there. So look forward to hearing those. And thank everyone for the time. And Charlotte, wonderful. Great to see you all. Great to see you. Thanks, Charlotte. Thanks, Neil. I appreciate it. That was great. Um,